our weakest are is now. Another four days, and Yaya would have missed his opportunity. These were the words of Major General K.K. Singh, Director of Military Operations and General Officer Commanding One Corps of the Indian Army, operationally responsible for the Shakargarh Bulge. With Yaya, Major General K.K. Singh is referring to General Yaya Khan, the then Commander-in-Chief of the Pakistan Army and the President of Pakistan. General K.K. Singh was assessing the possibility of preemptive offensives launched by Pakistan on India's Western Front before all the assets of one corps reached their positions near the Shakalgar Bulge. Most formations of one corps were located in the Indian hinterland as far as Hyderabad, and it was expected to take them about three weeks to concentrate the entire corps in the peripheral areas of the Shakalgar Bulge. Pakistan had a window of opportunity during October of 1971 to attack this region and make deep ingress into Indian territory. Hence the words of Major General K.K. Singh, our weakest hour is now. Another four days and Yaya would have missed his opportunity. Hostilities did begin on the Western Front, but around six weeks later. General Yaya Khan indeed missed his window of opportunity. Pakistan conducted preemptive strikes on the Indian western border and started offensives in the Chumb and Poonch region in the north. This began the third war between India and Pakistan on December 3, 1971. With Pakistan's strong offensive in Chumb and Poonch, the Indian armed forces launched a counter-offensive in the Shakargarh Bulge. This video details out the operations launched by the Indian armed forces during this offensive including the bravery displayed by the Indian Armed Forces in the Battle of Basantar. The Shakargarh Bulge is located in close proximity to multiple important locations on the Indian side, including Amritsar, Pathankot, and Jammu. And as a result, the enemy is in a good position to threaten major road and rail communication lines between Pathankot and Jammu. This communication line is the lifeline for the troops deployed further north in the Jammu and Rajori Poonch region, Srinagar and the rest of the Kashmir Valley, as well as the remote regions of Dras, Kargil and Leh. Clearly, threatening this line of communication would give the enemy considerable leverage once hostilities began on the Western Front. The Indian Armed Forces had taken cognizance of this threat and created offensive as well as defensive plans in the region. One core of the Indian Army was operationally responsible for the Shakargarh Bulge. With 36th Infantry Division under Major General B.S. Aluwalia in the Gurdaspur area, 39th Infantry Division under Major General B.R. Prabhu in the general area of Madhopur, and 54th Infantry Division under Major General W.A.G. Pinto in the general area of Samba between Bain River and Deg Nadi. The allocation of Pakistan forces to the Shakargarh Bulge and their assigned tasks were known to the Indian side from the information obtained from defecting East Pakistan officers. Pakistan One Corps was operationally responsible for the defense of the Shakargarh Bulge and its mission was to eliminate Indian enclaves on the Pakistani side in the general area of Shakargarh, Narawal, Zafarwal and Damtal. The Pakistan holding force on these three sides consisted of 8th and the 15th Infantry Divisions, supported by 8th Independent Armour Brigade. The 15th Infantry Division held the northern border covering the approaches to Sialkot and Chowinda, and the 8th Infantry Division manned the Zafarwal, Damtal and Narawal fortresses and the approaches to Basruf. The convict step of the bulge east of the fortress line, including the communication center of Shakargarh, was known to be defended by paramilitary forces, supported by covering troops consisting of 20 lancers and elements of reconnaissance and support battalions. The known battle location of the Pakistani Strike Force, 6th Armored Division and 17th Infantry Division was in the general area of Tuska and Basrur. In this posture, 
Pakistan had the advantage of reacting from the interior lines to an Indian move from any direction. Offensively, Pakistan had the option of hitting up north towards Jammu or down south towards Amritsar without upsetting the balance of its defensive posture. On the Indian side, contiguous to the zone defended by one corps, the shoulders of the bulge were held in the north by 26th Infantry Division under 15 Corps and 15th Infantry Division under 11 Corps, covering the south. Indian plans. The Chief of Army Staff, General Sam Manik Shah's aim was quite clear. First, he wanted to ensure the security of the sensitive areas of Akhnur, Jammu, Samba, Patankot, Gurdaspur, and Amritsar. Secondly, to safeguard road and rail communications between Putan Code and Jammu. Thirdly, to engage the Pakistan strike force in such a fashion so that it could not be extricated for employment in other sectors and cause as much attrition as possible in the process. And lastly, acquire as much territory as possible, especially in the Pakistan heartland, that could be used as a bargaining lever in post-war negotiations. So the Indian defensive plan was as follows. If the Pakistani thrust was initiated between Samba and Jammu in the direction of Jammu, the 26th and the 54th Infantry Divisions were to contain it, while 39 Infantry Division and one Armoured Brigade were to hit the lodgement area in Ramgarh. If Pakistan struck between Samba and Madhopur, 39 and 54 Infantry Divisions were to contain it while the 36th Infantry Division and one Armoured Brigade were to cross the Ravi River and disrupt enemy's line of communications in the area of Shakargarh. In case of a major offensive across Ravi, 15th Infantry Division would contain it, while 36th Infantry Division and one Armoured Brigade would counterattack in the general area of Dera Baba Nanak, and simultaneously, 39th and 54th Infantry Divisions would launch an offensive along the Shakargarh and Narwal axis. The Indian Offensive Plan In translating the chief's aims of engaging the Pakistan Strike Corps in the region so that it could not be deployed elsewhere, the Indian planners projected that the enemy should not be given a battle on the ground of its choosing, which was the area of Pasroor and Kila Sobhasing. This is where the Pakistani armor had an advantage of using fortresses as pivots for maneuver and capability of bringing down massive artillery concentrations from prepared positions. Any effort of attacking here would be costly in attrition as well as for operational time schedule. The Indian side wanted to draw out the Pakistani strike force from their strong fortified positions and force an engagement of attrition outside of it. Once the Pakistani strike element was humbled in battle, the door would be open to sensitive areas in the Pakistan hinterland. The Indian side proposed to develop three divergent thrusts. 36th and 54th Infantry Divisions were to attack to capture the Pakistani strong points of Zafarwal, Dhamtal, Narawal, and Kila Soba Singh. It was hoped that this would force the enemy to commit his reserve formations outside of its fortified areas into the battle. Once the enemy's reserve formations are committed, that is when the 39th Infantry Division would initiate an offensive and break out of the general area of Nandpur Ramgarh towards the enemy's rear in the Pasroor area. The Nandpur Ramgarh Samba sector was to be held by 39th Infantry Division in a defensive posture till the enemy revealed his hand and committed his reserve formations. As the situation kept deteriorating in East Pakistan, Pakistan's President General Yahya Khan threatened India with a total war. On November 30th, 1971, the Government of India received an intelligence report indicating that Pakistan would attack in the West within the next few days. This proved to be right. The attack came at Chumb on December 3rd, 1971. 10th Infantry Division holding Cham, was planning an offensive of its own and it was totally surprised by the Pakistan attack. A desperate battle for the defense of Aknur raged in this sector. Pakistan also launched an attack on Poonch 
and the 33 Infantry Brigade of one corps had to be sent to reinforce Poonch. In response to the Pakistan offensive, India decided to launch a counter-strike with one corps in the Shakargarh bulge. The government of India received an intelligence report indicating that Pakistan would attack in the West within the next few days. This proved to be right. The attack came at Chumb on December 3rd, 1971. 10th Infantry Division holding Chumb was planning an offensive of its own and it was totally surprised by the Pakistan attack. A desperate battle for the defense of Aknur raged in this sector. Pakistan also launched an attack on Poonch and the 33 Infantry Brigade of one corps had to be sent to reinforce Poonch. In response to the Pakistan offensive, India decided to launch a counter-strike with one corps in the Shakargarh bulge. Pakistan's one corps was responsible for the defense of the area. 15th Infantry Division was deployed from Chenab to the Deg Nadi and was responsible for guarding the approaches to Sialkot. The 8th Infantry Division was responsible for the defense of areas further east including Zafarwal, Thamtal, Narawal and Shakargarh. The defences were well prepared. There was an anti-tank ditch along the international border on the Shakargarh bulge. Besides that, all major towns had anti-tank ditches that were integrated into belts of defences running from Deg Nadi to Zafarwal, Thamtal and further south. On the Indian side, the initial plans were altered a little after some brigades of one corps had to be sent to Poonch to reinforce their defence against Pakistan's initial assault. The new plans and objectives were as follows. 39th Infantry Division, under Major General B.R. Prabhu, was given the task of advancing between Basantar and Karir Nadi and capture Delra and Chakra by D plus two days, and thereafter capture Shakargarh. The 54th Infantry Division, under Major General Pinto, was given the task to advance in the area between Deg Nadi and Karir Nadi and capture the Zafarwal Thamtal line. 36th Infantry Division was to stay in reserve until the enemy made its move in the battle. Operations in the Shakargarh bulge commenced in the night of December 5th, 1971, with both 39th and the 54th Infantry Division launching their attacks simultaneously. In a quick initial success, the 39th Division captured Pakistan's border outposts during the morning of the 6th, 39th Division then continued their advance towards their next objective, the village of Harar Kalan. Harar Kalan was well fortified by the enemy with strong defences set up in the village. They also had anti-tank minefields set up around its boundaries to stop any ingress from the Indian side towards their defence positions. 39th Division, before launching an attack, would first need to secure a safe lane from their tanks to pass through the minefield and then form an attack on the enemy positions. They started their advance towards Harar Kalan, but as soon as they hit the minefields, their progress got bogged down. Their progress got bogged down in an attempt to clear the minefields. The engineers worked to clear out the minefields under heavy fire till the afternoon of December 7th, 1971. Night of December 7th, 39th Division moved its leading infantry battalion to assault Harar Kalan. The enemy, with its strong defences, fought fiercely and pushed back the attack. The attack failed with considerable losses for the Indian side, with 24 killed in action and 65 wounded. The 54th Infantry Division, after launching its attack, captured the border outposts on the night of December 6th and continued their advance to their first objective, the village of Dharman. Pakistan had deployed one squadron of 20 lancers with Shafi tanks, one squadron of 33 cavalry with Patton tanks, along with infantry elements to stop the Indian ingress. Pakistan Air Force was also quite active in the region. 54th Infantry Division advanced towards Sarman, and soon they also hit their first minefield. Their objective now was to establish a bridgehead in Bari Dharman area and secure the minefields for their tanks to pass through safely. A bridgehead 
is a strong position secured by an army inside enemy territory from which it can form further attacks into the enemy territory. In a typical fashion, the advancing side upon countering an obstacle like a river or a canal or a minefield creates a secure zone at the other side of the obstacle by first sending in their infantry. This secure zone, generally 400 meters by 400 meters or 400 meters by 800 meters is called a bridgehead. Once a bridgehead is created, the next step is for the advancing side to make arrangements for their armor to safely cross the obstacle. So if it's a minefield, that would include clearing out anti-tank mines from the field and mark the safe passage. If it's a river or a canal, use military bridging equipment to create a bridge to facilitate the tanks and other mechanized infantry to pass through to the other side. Time is a huge factor in this whole process because the enemy is expected to attack the bridgehead within 30 to 45 minutes of the advancing parties creating the bridgehead. So if the armor is not able to reach the bridgehead in time to reinforce the troops, the bridgehead could be lost. The task of creating the bridgehead was given to 16 Madras supported by four horse. They commenced the attack at 2.30 a.m. December 6th, 1971. The first enemy opposition was encountered very quickly. During the enemy attack, 16 Madras captured a Shafi tank and a soldier who had a map showing the layout of the minefields in the area. This created an opportunity for 54 Infantry Division to quickly clear out the minefields and form an attack. And 16 Madras launched an attack at Dharman. Within few hours of fighting, by 7 a.m. of December 6th, the positions in Dharman were captured. After capturing Dharman, 16 Madras resumed their advance further south towards Bari. Soon they came across another deep minefield north of Bari. In a calculated risk, the trawling of the minefield was carried out by 405 Field Company in a dust haze before last light. Two Centurion tanks were placed at vantage points on the home side of the minefield to provide covering fire. Another Centurion tank followed the trawl tanks to provide intimate fire support. While the trawling was going on, the following tank noticed three enemy tanks in a hull down position and opened fire. One enemy tank was immobilized while the others withdrew. The trawling was completed by 6.30 p.m. and a squadron of tanks was inducted into the bridgehead. 405 Field Company had breached a 500 meter deep minefield in just one hour. An attack was launched on enemy positions leading to Bari and after a hard fight, the positions were captured by 10.30 p.m. of December 6th. One enemy tank, two machine guns, and a map case showing alignments of minefields were also captured. Using the minefield maps, 405 Field Company completed the breaching and marking of the minefield by 2 a.m. on December 7th. The next objective for 54th Division now was Bari. 16th Madras moved to the north tip of Bari and moved a combat group to probe it and capture it if possible. The combat group left at midnight and approached Bari by the west. At 1.30 a.m. December 7th, the combat group attacked Bari from the west. The enemy were completely surprised by the speed and direction of the attack and fled their positions. Bari was captured before first light of December 7th. 39th Infantry Division, after failing their first attempt to capture Harar Kalan frontly, decided to outflank the position by sidestepping 2,000 yards east of the village and attack the enemy from there. The armored infantry column reached Shahbazpur rather late in the afternoon of December 8th after a difficult approach. Then they hit the minefields there. They hit the minefields there and the troll tranks started to breach it. Two of them successfully got across, but the third one blew up on an old mine. Due to the delay in reaching the west flank of Harar Kalan, it was almost dark now. The minefield had not been cleared yet and Major General Prabhu, commander of 39th Infantry Division, anticipated an attack from the enemy tank hunting parties on their positions. So, 
they left the two forward tanks and trolls to be abandoned in the minefield and called off the attack. With this, the second attempt at taking Harar Kalan by 39th Infantry Division also failed. On the other side, 54th Infantry Division, with the capture of Bari, enlarged their bridgehead and built troop strength south of Bari, with the objective of pushing further south towards the Zafarwal Dhamtal line. 16 Madras, with the support of a company of 18 Rajputana rifles and a squadron of 17 horse, launched an assault and captured a small village south of Bari. But at this stage, the failure of operations conducted by 39th Infantry Division to capture Harar Kalan and subsequently Delra and Charka began to affect the operations of 54th Infantry Division. The enemy had a strong pivot position in Delra and Charka, held by a squadron of armor and infantry troops. Until this position was reduced, the flanks of both 39th and 54th Infantry Divisions in their subsequent advance were under serious threat because the enemy could launch attacks on the flanks of both 39th and 54th Divisions. It became imperative for the Indian side to clear this area before 54th Division could continue with their operations southward. Delra derived much of its strength from a fortified position around the Charka village and the enemy had developed the Charka defences with considerable skill and ingenuity. Delra, with a protective minefield in the front and strong defences set up around it, assaulting this position frontally was unthinkable. But with 54 divisions rapid progress along their thrust line, there was an opportunity to attack Charka from the rear. So the objective of capturing Charka Delra positions was assigned to 54th Infantry Division. It was December 8th now, three days since commencement of ingress from the Indian side into Shakargarh. And despite strong early gains by 54th Division, the enemy had not yet committed their strike element anywhere in the region. Committing the Pakistan strike element outside of its fortified positions was one of the objectives of the offensive so that the Indian side could force a battle of attrition with the Pakistan strike force and the reserve Indian 36th Division could attack the Pakistan territories in the rear. But so far, the enemy was able to sustain the Indian thrusts with its regular defense force and did not have the need to engage its strike force into the battle. So, to try and force the enemy's hand, Major General K.K. Singh decided to develop a thrust towards Shakargarh across the Ravi River. This was to be done by the 36th Infantry Division under the command of Major General B.S. Alwalia. 8 a.m. December 9, 1971, 115 Infantry Brigade initiated its operations in the region with the first objective of capturing Nanakot and subsequently launching an attack at Shakargarh. This thrust made some quick gains and captured Naina Court by the afternoon of December 10th, 1971. Meanwhile, after two unsuccessful attempts at capturing Harar Kalan, 39th Infantry Division planned their third attempt at the position on the night of December 9th. But 54th Infantry Division was also about to launch an attack on Charka and Delra on December 10th. So 39th Division's planned attack was postponed to the 10th as well, for it to coincide with the 54th Infantry Division's attack. Both attacks went in simultaneously. 39th Infantry Division's attack on Harar Kalan was successful. Despite strong enemy showing, 39th Division, in their third attempt, successfully captured the enemy positions and achieved its first objective. They then quickly started moving south towards their objective of Shakargarh. They moved ahead and hit the minefield protecting the north of Shakargarh. Further advance got halted in their efforts to clear out the minefield. 39th Infantry Division continued efforts to breach the second minefield at various spots, but no headway was made. Even though seven days had elapsed from the start of hostilities, it seemed unlikely that at this rate, 39th Infantry Division would be able to reach Shakargarh in the immediate future. 
On the other side, eight grenadiers and four horse from the 54th Infantry Division launched a well-prepared attack on Charka after last light on December 10th and breached the minefield. After a fierce battle that lasted almost four hours, the position was captured by the Indian side. The enemy lost six Patton tanks in this action. Without wasting any time, 6th Kumang from 54th Division attacked Dilra and successfully captured that as well. With the capture of Charka and Delra, the flanks of both divisions were now secure. 16 Madras from 54 Division, meanwhile, continued their operation southward and captured more villages, getting them closer to their final objective of reaching Zafarwal Tamtal line. On the Shakargarh side, while the first thrust of 36th Division with 115 Infantry Brigade had taken Nainakot, Major General Aluwalia launched a second thrust towards Shakargarh from the north on the night of December 9th. Their first objective was capturing the village of Iklaspur and then move westwards to threaten Shakargarh. They launched the thrust and quickly captured the village and swiftly moved towards Shakargarh from the northeast. 115 Infantry Brigade, after capturing their first objective Nanakot, continued their advance on December 11th along the nanakot shakargarh axis. This is when they received an information of an enemy armored squadron of 33 cavalry with Patton tanks advancing along the narkot nanakot axis to intercept them. 14 horse was diverted along this axis to push back the incoming Patton tanks while the remaining troops continue with their advance. 14 horse went along the axis and attacked the incoming tank squadron. The enemy suffered heavy losses, abandoning half of their tanks before making their way back. On the approaches to Shakargarh, 115 Infantry Brigade encountered light opposition of paramilitary forces and one armored squadron. By the night of December 12th, the 115 Infantry Brigade pushed back the resistance and reached east of the Bend River, ready to launch an attack into Shakargarh. They sent a company of four grenadiers under Major Chaudhry after last light on December 13th with the task of reconnaissance in enemy forces. Major Chaudhry managed to contact the enemy minefield and found gaps in it. He left some guides in the gaps to lead the rest of the troops and went ahead and attacked the village of Dinpur Khut on the outskirts of Shakargarh and quickly captured it. This was a perfect launch pad for them to initiate an attack into Shakargarh. After he reported this progress, Major Chaudhry waited for the rest of the battalion to marry up for the attack on the town next morning. The battalion left its base east of the Bayan River about midnight of December 13th and crossed a dry riverbed with a lot of noise from its accompanying tanks. The enemy heard the tank noises and became aware of a major attack being planned on Shakargarh. They started pounding the incoming movements with artillery and machine gun fire. The Indian side suffered some losses, but they continued to push forward to get to their objective. But then the leading tanks hit some soft grounds and started getting bogged down. This was a dangerous situation because if the column got bogged down under enemy fire, they would be sitting ducks for the enemy. The tanks at the back of the column became hesitant of moving ahead and the battalion commander, after assessing the situation, called off the attack and ordered Major Chaudhry to leave his position and make his way back to the firm base. By first light on December 14th, four grenadiers had scrambled back to the base with some casualties. But the enemy surrounded Major Chaudhry's troops at Dilpur Khurd with an infantry company and a troop of tanks. Major Chaudhary and his company fought bravely against the attacks on them without tank and artillery support and held out against the enemy till the evening of December 14th, 1971. But in the end, Major Chaudhary and his company of 72 men were captured by the enemy and taken prisoners. With this, the first attempt at capturing Chakargarh failed. Major General Aluwalia planned another attack at Chakargarh the same night. This attack also did not materialize into a victory 
due to some tactical constraints and low morale of the troops. Meanwhile, preparations for the attack across the Basanta River began on December 12, 1971. The operation involved attacking enemy defenses across the Basanta River. To achieve this, a bridgehead was to be established by 47th Infantry Brigade in the Lalial Ghazipur Badapind area across the Basanta River. 16th Independent Brigade was to advance from the bridgehead and contact Zafarwal. 74th Brigade was to follow up and capture the rest of the Supwal ditch. The east flank of the enemy defenses was protected by a 1400 meters deep minefield laid on the bed of the Basanta River. The task of providing the firm base for the attack was given to 91st Infantry Brigade. By 4 p.m. on December 14th, they captured the east bank of Basanta River against stiff opposition. The operations across Basanta could now be carried out. Pakistan's 24th Infantry Brigade, having three infantry battalions, was responsible for the defense of the Supwal Ditch, Jarpal and Barapind area. A company of its recce and support battalion was deployed on the west bank of Basantar Nadi. An armoured regiment supported the brigade. In addition, eight independent armoured brigade and two armoured regiments and an armoured infantry battalion were available as a part of divisional reserves. Enemy Air Force was very active and put in 30 sorties against 47 Infantry Brigade on December 15th. The 47th Infantry Brigade had three infantry battalions, three grenadiers, six matras and 16 matras. It was also allotted 17 horse and 18 Rajputana rifles for the battle. Artillery support was available from the Divisional Artillery Brigade reinforced by two medium regiments. Three field company of nine engineer regiment was to support them reaching the minefield with trolls and improving the track through the riverbed. The Battle of Basantar. The plan of attack for 47 Infantry Brigade was as under. 16 Madras would lead the assault across the Basantar River and capture Sarat Chak and Lalial Reserve Forest. Thereafter, Three grenadiers were to follow and capture Jarpal. Six Madras and 17 horse were to be inducted after the minefield was breached and were to occupy the gap, including Ghazipur Reserve Forest, between 16 Madras and three grenadiers. The engineers were to breach two vehicle safe lanes through the minefields, one by trolls and one by hand breaching. December 15, 1971, 7.30 p.m. was the HR for the attack to go in. The task of providing the firm base for the attack was given to 91st Infantry Brigade. By 4 p.m. on December 14th, they captured the east bank of Basanta River against stiff opposition. The operations across Basanta could now be carried out. Pakistan's 24th Infantry Brigade, having three infantry battalions, was responsible for the defense of the Supwal Ditch, Jarpal and Barapind area. A company of its recce and support battalion was deployed on the west bank of the Basantar River. An armored regiment supported the brigade. In addition, eight independent armored brigade and two armored regiments and an armored infantry battalion were available as a part of divisional reserves. Enemy Air Force was very active and put in 30 sorties against 47th Infantry Brigade on December 15th. The 47th Infantry Brigade had three infantry battalions, three grenadiers, six matras and 16 matras. It was also allotted 17 horse and 18 Rajputana rifles for the battle. Artillery support was available from the Divisional Artillery Brigade reinforced by two medium regiments. Three field company of nine engineer regiment was to support them for breaching the minefield with trolls and improving the track through the riverbed. The Battle of Basantar. The plan of attack for 47 Infantry Brigade was as under. 16 Madras would lead the assault across the Basantar River and capture Sarat Chak 
and Lalial Reserve Forest. Thereafter, three grenadiers were to follow and capture Jarpal. Six Madras and 17 horse were to be inducted after the minefield was breached and were to occupy the gap between 16 Madras and three grenadiers. The engineers were to breach two vehicle safe lanes through the minefields, one by trolls and one by hand breaching. December 15, 1971, 7.30 p.m. was the HR for the attack to go in. The first attack was launched by 16 Madras at HR on December 15th with the initial objective of Sarachak and Lalial Reserve Forest. The companies had to assault through a 1,400-meter wide minefield without proper breaching under constant heavy artillery shelling from the enemy. The enemy had well-prepared defenses with bunkers, weapon placements, and communication trenches. The battle continued for almost two hours, and after a fierce fight, 16 Madras achieved its first objective. The intensity of the battle can be gauged from the fact that in this action, 16 Madras lost 27 men with 82 wounded. Havaldar Filippos was leading a platoon in the attack as the platoon commander and got wounded during the attack. Despite suffering serious wounds, he continued to lead the assault of his platoon, captured four enemy bunkers. For his gallantry, Havaldar Filippos was awarded the Mahavir Chakra. Lalial Reserve Forest was captured by 9.30 p.m. December 15, 1971, and Sarachak was captured 30 minutes later at 10 p.m. The enemy immediately launched multiple counter-attacks on both the location, but was beaten back by 60 Madras. The engineers commenced breaching the minefields at 9.30 p.m., with 405 Field Company breaching the lane with trolls under intense enemy shelling. The vehicle safe lane to the 1400 meter deep minefield had hardly been marked up to halfway when a concerning message came from 16 Madras. Enemy tanks in Ghazipur area had started moving towards 16 Madras positions in Sarachak, making the situation critical at the bridgehead. Since the minefield had not been completely cleared, the Indian tanks could not safely cross it and come to reinforce 16 Madras. And without the cover from the armor elements from its side, 16 Madras would come under immense pressure from the incoming enemy tanks. After assessing the situation, Commanding Officer 17 Horse, Lieutenant Colonel Hanut Singh, ordered the C Squadron under Major Ajay Singh to move into the bridgehead through the half-marked vehicle-safe lane. This was a high-risk move 17 Horse took but waiting till the minefield was secured would have given a good opportunity to the enemy to push 16 Madras out of Sarachak and Lalial. So, at 2.30 a.m. December 16, 1971, C Squadron, led by Major Ajay Singh, entered the minefield. At the halfway mark, the officer of the engineer regiment stopped the squadron force from breaching the minefield. However, in view of the gravity of the situation, the tanks were allowed to pass and guided through the minefield. Miraculously, there were no casualties to the tanks due to the mines and all tanks safely crossed the minefield. But as the leading tanks emerged onto the enemy side of the minefield, they came under enemy tank fire from the direction of Sarat Chuck. The leading Indian tank opened fire at the enemy tanks and destroyed one that had been dug in. Thereafter, the squadron formed up and moved in assault formations towards Ghazipur Reserve Forest where the enemy tanks had been reported. This unnerved the enemy and they withdrew from their positions, calling off the attack at Sarachak. The bridgehead was saved. On the Jarpal front, three grenadiers commenced its attack on Jarpal at 9.30 p.m. December 15, 1971. In this attack, Major Hoshiar Singh led the assault of Charlie Company and after a fierce fight, occupied a low-lying position 200 yards short of a village at 3 a.m. With the first light, the enemy started to fire at his company. Major Hoshiar Singh was badly wounded during this attack, but he refused to evacuate 
and continue to stay with this company during its counterattack. The enemy was anxious to throw back three grenadiers before the Indian side could consolidate its position in the region. So they mounted an attack on Charlie Company's positions with tanks and infantry. Charlie Company, under Major Hoshiar Singh, did not retreat. They stood their ground and beat back multiple attacks from the enemy on their positions till the Indian tanks of 17 horse joined the battle and helped consolidate three grenadiers' position in the battle. The enemy suffered considerable losses during this operation with 85 killed in action, including the commanding officer and three other officers of the assaulting battalion. For his exemplary conduct during the strong fire from the enemy, Major Hoshiar Singh was awarded the Parambir Chakra. The engineers continued their work on breaching the minefield throughout the night under heavy enemy shelling. It was under their bravery it was possible for 17 horse to safely pass through the minefields and reach in time to reinforce Major Hoshiar Singh and Charlie Company of three grenadiers. Major V. R. Chaudhary from 9 Engineer Regiment showed exemplary gallantry and leadership during the mine breaching operations under heavy enemy shelling. One enemy shell hit in close vicinity of Major Chaudhary and he lost his life. During this mine breaching operation, 9 Engineer Regiment suffered very heavy losses with 9 killed in action and 17 wounded. For his leadership and bravery during this operation, Major V. R. Chaudhary was posthumously awarded the Mahavir Chakra. 9 Engineer Regiment for its role in this operation was awarded one Mahavir Chakra, three Veer Chakras, and four Sena Medals. Nine Engineer Regiment breached the minefield in time for six Madras and 17 horse and a company of Rajputana rifles to be inducted into the battle before first light. Six Madras was ordered to commence its operations of attacking the gap between 16 Madras and three Grenadiers in the Ghazipur Reserve Forest area. Meanwhile, some enemy infantry had also infiltrated into the bridgehead. They developed their first major counterattack at 8 a.m. on December 16, 1971. 31 cavalry of Pakistan's 8th Independent Armoured Brigade laid a smoke screen in front of Ghazipur, and as soon as the smoke was lifted, the enemy tanks in large numbers began their assault on the Indian positions. With initial accurate fire from the enemy, 17 horse suffered some losses and lost a few tanks. 17 horse then started their counter-attack at the enemy and soon enough started dominating the field. 31 cavalry suffered heavy losses in the attack and was pinned down by 17 horse. Seeing 31 cavalry pinned down by the Indian side, Pakistan's 13 lancers started moving towards 17 horse with the plan of assaulting its flanks through the gap between Jarpal and Ghazipur, with another attack on three grenadiers in Jarpal. The position at Jarpal, with three grenadiers and two troops of Squadron B of 17 horse, found themselves hopelessly outnumbered by the incoming enemy tanks and called for reinforcements. Seeing the battalion under severe threat from the enemy tanks, an armored troop under the command of Captain V. Malhotra were ordered forward from Jarpal. The other two tanks were commanded by 2nd Lieutenant Avtar Singh Ehlawat and 2nd Lieutenant Arun Khetarpal. During the operations in the Shakargarh Bulge, by the early morning of December 16, 1971, the Indian Armed Forces had successfully crossed the Basanta River and created a bridgehead. The Indian forces now could plan and execute operations deeper into Pakistan territory. Three grenadiers, with their bravery and resilience, had captured the town of Jadpal, but their positions were constantly being threatened by Pakistan forces who had infiltrated the bridgehead. Three grenadiers were supported by two troops of Squadron B of 17 horse in pushing back any counter-offensives from the enemy. 
This is when the news came in of a major strength of armor of 13 Lancers of the enemy rapidly approaching towards the positions held by the Indian side in Jarpal. The Indian force defending Jarpal would soon be outnumbered by the incoming enemy force. So they called for reinforcements. Responding to the reinforcement call from the front lines, an armored troop was sent to the Indian defenses. This was under the command of Captain V. Malhotra, with the other two tanks commanded by 2nd Lieutenant Avtar Singh Alhawat and 2nd Lieutenant Arun Khetarpal. They were ordered forward from Jarpal to engage the enemy. While advancing, they came under attack from recoilless guns concealed in bunkers in the flank. To silence the guns, Lieutenant Kitarpal and Lieutenant Alawat, led by Captain Malotra, made a headlong charge and overran the guns and captured the crew at pistol point. They began to move forward again. Soon after, an enemy squadron of 13 Lancers commenced their assault with artillery support from their positions. They moved ahead cautiously towards Captain Malotra's positions to commence their assault. A fierce firefight began with the enemy pressing towards Captain Malotra's positions. Meanwhile, Captain Malotra was able to put the two troops on either sides of his tank. Lieutenant Alawat's tank to his left and Lieutenant Ketarpal to his right. The initial clashes were intense. The enemy's assault was halted by some aggressive action and maneuvering by Lieutenant Elawat. He destroyed two enemy tanks, but was hit by a third enemy tank. Second Lieutenant Avtar Singh Elawat was seriously wounded and had to be evacuated. With Lieutenant Elawat's tank out of the battle, the weight of the enemy assault starting bearing on Captain Malotra and Lieutenant Ketarpal's tanks. Captain Malotra scored direct hits on two enemy tanks, making them inoperational. But during the counteraction, Captain Malotra's tank gun jammed. With Lieutenant Elawat out of action and Captain Malotra's gun jammed, the situation became precarious for the Indian side. Captain Malotra requested permission from his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Hanut Singh, to withdraw to repair his gun, but a rearward movement could have triggered panic in the battle. This would make the enemy in a good position to take advantage of the opportunity and overrun the Indian positions. So the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Hanut Singh, ordered that there would be no rearward movement and all the tanks would fight from wherever they are. The defect in Captain Malotra's tank left only Lieutenant Khetarpal to take on the enemy. The enemy attack built up again. Now it was just one tank of 2nd Lieutenant Arun Khetarpal that was standing between the enemy attack and the Indian positions. In quick succession, Lieutenant Khetarpal destroyed two enemy tanks. His tank was then hit by enemy fire and it burst into flames. The tank was still functional, so Lieutenant Ketarpal continued the counter-attack on the enemy and he destroyed another enemy tank. His tank was hit by enemy fire again. This was the second hit on his tank and this one did some serious damage to the tank. Lieutenant Ketarpal was also badly wounded. Captain Malhotra observed this and ordered Lieutenant Ketarpal to bail out of the tank, but there was no other tanks remaining on the Indian side to resist the remaining enemy tanks. So Lieutenant Ketarpal decided to stay on and fight. His message to Captain Malhotra was, no sir, I will not abandon my tank. My gun is still working and I will get the rest. On the enemy side, there was still one tank that was remaining and it was quickly closing in on the Indian positions. This was the tank of then Major 
Khwaja Muhammad Nasir of the Pakistan Army. His tank moved forward and came about 75 meters to Lieutenant Khedarpal's position. Both the tanks were facing each other and both of them fired. Lieutenant Khedarpal hit the enemy tank, making it inoperational. But the fire from the enemy tank also scored a hit on Lieutenant Khedarpal's tank. This was the fourth hit on his tank and unfortunately this was the fatal one. The operator of Famagusta, Lieutenant Khedarpal's tank, Sawar Nan Singh died on the spot and the gunner of the tank was seriously wounded. Lieutenant Khedarpal's tank driver, also injured after the hit, doused the fire and went to check in on his tank commander, 2nd Lieutenant Arun Khedarpal. He was seriously wounded and asked for water, but passed away before he could take his last sip. For his bravery and sacrifice during a crucial moment in the Battle of Basantar, 2nd Lieutenant Arun Khedarpal was awarded the Paramvir Chakra. India's highest military honor. His citation later read, his calculated and deliberate decision to fight from his burning tank was an act of valor and self-sacrifice beyond the call of duty. He was just 21 years old. The attack of 13 Lancers of the Pakistani army on the Indian positions at Jarpal was successfully repulsed by 17 Pune horse of the Indian Army. By the evening of December 16, 1971, with more reinforcements, Pune horse stabilized the battle and pushed back two more attempts of the enemy to break through the Indian defense positions. For his leadership during the Battle of Basantar, Lieutenant Colonel Hanut Singh, commanding officer 17 Pune horse, was awarded the Mahavir Chakra. India's second highest military honor. During the night of December 16th and 17th, 1971, a squadron of four horse, along with its regimental headquarters, was inducted into the bridgehead to reinforce three grenadiers area at Jarpal. Just as they took up positions in the early hours of December 17th for further offensives deep into Pakistan, Dhaka on the Eastern Front had fallen and the East Pakistan Army had surrendered to the Indian Armed Forces, ceasefire had been declared between the two countries. Pakistan losses in the Battle of Basantar, as counted by the Indian Army, were as follows. 43 tanks destroyed and 10 captured. 222 soldiers killed in action with around 900 wounded. Indian losses in the Battle of Basantar, Two tanks destroyed and 13 damaged. 169 soldiers killed in action and 506 wounded, 17 missing. The Battle of Basantar was a saga of courage and determination. The success of the battle depended on the ability of troops in the bridgehead to beat off the expected enemy counterattacks. That the bridgehead remained intact was largely due to memorable actions fought by 17 horse, 16 madras, and 3 grenadiers. 17 horse destroyed a major portion of Pakistan's 8 independent armored brigade. 9 engineer regiment breached the minefield in time and made the induction of armor into the bridgehead possible. It was a remarkable victory. Sir, I regret to tell you that I am the man who killed your son. These were the words of Brigadier Khwaja Mohammad Nasir of the Pakistan Army to Brigadier M. L. Khedarpal of the Indian Army in the year 2001. Brigadier M. L. Khedarpal, 81 years old at that time, felt a strong desire to visit his birthplace at Sargodha in Pakistan. At Lahore Airport, 
Brigadier Khetarpal was received by Brigadier Nasir, who took it upon himself to be Brigadier Khetarpal's host and guide during his trip. Brigadier Nasir really went out of his way to ensure that Brigadier Khetarpal had a satisfying and nostalgic visit to his old house in Sargoda, and upon his return to Lahore, he was once again the guest of Brigadier Nasir for three days. Brigadier Khetarpal was overwhelmed by the extreme kindness, courtesy and respect bestowed upon him by Brigadier Nasir and the members of his family. However, he felt that something was amiss but could not make out what it was. There were long silences in between animated conversations. There was a look of compassion in the eyes of his family members. He could not make out why he was being treated as someone very special. On the last night before Brigadier Khetarpal's departure, Brigadier Nasir said, Sir, there is something that I wanted to tell you for many years but I did not know how to get through to you. Finally, fate intervened and sent you to me as an honored guest. The last few days, we have become close to one another and that has made what I'm about to say all the more difficult. I too participated in the 1971 war. I was then a young major, squadron commander of Pakistan Army's 13 Lancers. Brigadier Khetarpal was taken aback since 13 Lancers was the same regiment fighting his son's regiment 17 Pune Horse on December 16, 1971 during the 1971 war. Brigadier Nasir continued, We fought Pune Horse in the Battle of Basantar. Sir, I am the man who killed your son. On that fateful day, your son and I were soldiers, unknown to one another, fighting for the respect and safety of our respective countries. Arun's courage was exemplary and he fearlessly moved his tank, totally unconcerned for his own safety. Both sides had lost a lot of tanks, till finally there were just the two of us left facing one another. We both fired simultaneously. It was destined that I was to live and he was to die. It was only later that I got to know who he was and how young he was. I had all along thought that I would ask for your forgiveness. But in telling the story, I realize that there is nothing to forgive. Instead, I salute your son for what he did at such a young age. And I salute you because I know how he grew into such a young man. In the end, it's character and value that matters. The young officer of the Indian Army that Brigadier Khwaja Muhammad Nasir was talking about was Second Lieutenant Arun Khedarpal. The date was December 16, 1971. 